Hello everyone. Today I'll be discussing diagnostic frameworks and differential diagnoses. To demonstrate these concepts, we'll be using a patient case. A man presents with acute shortness of breath. What might his diagnosis be? Well, it, it could be a lot of things. After all, we don't know anything about him as an individual. We don't know his age or his past medical history. Does he have asthma or congenital heart disease? Or is he immunocompromised? And we don't know anything about his symptoms. For example, did his shortness of breath come on instantaneously? Or did it build up over a few hours? Is it constant in severity? Or does it wax and wane? Is it made worse by lying down? And is it associated with any other symptoms like chest pain or nausea or lightheadedness? With so many things unknown, we really can't speculate about what is causing shortness of breath in him specifically. But we can recall what diseases and pathologic states can cause shortness of breath more generally. And knowledge of those diseases will help guide the questions we'll ask him. For this, we can use something called a diagnostic framework. A diagnostic framework, also known as a diagnostic schema, is a categorized list of etiologies for a certain symptom, physical finding, or lab abnormality. Frameworks can be categorized based on organ system, which is overall the most common, anatomic region, or physiologic mechanism. There are a few other more specific categorization strategies, such as type of microorganism for a suspected infection, like bacteria versus viruses, versus fungi versus parasites. So let's take a look at a diagnostic framework for acute dyspnea. Dyspnea being the medical term for shortness of breath. I'll start off with an organ system based framework. We can consider possible etiologies as falling into the pulmonary or cardiovascular systems, and there are plenty of miscellaneous causes too. In the pulmonary system, and don't pay attention to the particular order for now, we can list a pneumothorax, or air within the pleural space around the lung, a pleural effusion, which is fluid within the pleural space, an exacerbation of either COPD or asthma, a mucus plug, which consists of a glob of mucus literally obstructing a major airway, pneumonia, aspiration pneumonitis, which is an inflammatory process of the alveoli and distal airways caused by aspiration of food or secretions, inhalational injury, the broad category of interstitial lung disease, and a pulmonary embolism, which is a blood clot in one of the pulmonary arteries. This list of pulmonary causes of acute dyspnea is not complete, but it covers the most common and important conditions. Moving to the cardiovascular system, we have pericarditis, which is inflammation of the outer lining of the heart, a pericardial effusion, which is fluid within the pericardial space, myocarditis, which is inflammation of the heart muscle, acute decompensated heart failure, which may be more of a syndrome than a true disease, endocarditis, which is an infection of a heart valve, acute valve rupture, bradyarrhythmias and tachyarrhythmias, which are unusually slow and fast heart rhythms respectively, Acute coronary syndrome, which is an umbrella term that most notably includes heart attacks, and hypertensive emergency. And in the miscellaneous category, we have any cause of acute anemia, acute neuromuscular disease that prevents the diaphragm from working properly, renal failure by leading to a buildup of excess fluid in the body, metabolic acidosis in which the brain's respiratory centers increase a person's respiratory rate and or depth of breathing, as a compensatory mechanism to maintain normal pH, upper airway obstruction, such as aspiration of a foreign body, and anxiety, for example, a panic attack. So this is a basic example of a diagnostic framework. It's a categorized list of etiologies for a particular symptom. However, we can add another level of categorization by subdividing the major systems into functional components. What I mean by that is consider what are the basic constituents of the lungs. You have the pleura, the airways, the alveoli, the interstitium, and the vessels. So let's reorganize a bit further and replace each pulmonary etiology into one of those subcategories. What about the cardiovascular system? There are some analogous components. You have the pericardium, the myocardium, 
the valves, the conduction system, and once again the vessels. One thing to consider when constructing diagnostic frameworks is that there is usually not one correct way to do it. For example, what if we did not want to use an organ system based framework, but instead wanted to consider physiologic mechanisms? We would need to think about what mechanisms are behind the development of dyspnea. In other words, what is the specific trigger for the sensation of shortness of breath? A person can feel shorter breath because of hypoxemia or low partial pressure of oxygen in the arterial blood, hypercapnia or high partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the blood, acidemia or low blood pH, poor oxygen delivery in the absence of true hypoxemia, and there are a few miscellaneous causes like mechanical loading of the respiratory system and psychiatric causes. And we can reshuffle the specific etiologies from the previous framework into our new one. How should you choose which organizational system to use for a framework? Well, since the framework is largely a memory tool for yourself to help you remember what conditions you should be considering as you evaluate your patient, the best framework is the one that feels the most logical to you because it will be the easiest to remember. So not every learner or every clinician needs to use the same framework for the same symptom. So now let's return to our case. As I said earlier, we can't speculate about a diagnosis yet because we have no information. So let's hear more about him. The chief complaint. He is a 42-year-old man with a history of diabetes and hypertension who presented to the ER with dyspnea for 30 minutes. He was in his usual state of health until two days ago, at which time he developed the abrupt onset of dyspnea while watching television at home. He did not change position or attempt to stand up at the time, and he had no associated symptoms, including no chest pain, no palpitations, and no lightheadedness. After about five minutes, the dyspnea spontaneously resolved. Today, while walking around outside with his wife, it occurred again, but this time it did not resolve. He tried waiting it out on a bench and was unable to walk back to their car. After 30 minutes without improvement, his wife insisted on calling 911. He reported no recent cough, changes of weight, or sick contacts. His past medical history is notable for diabetes and hypertension, as mentioned. Medications include lisinopril, amlodipine, and insulin. He works as a restaurant manager and lives with his wife in Palo Alto. He has no recent travel. He has rare alcohol use and no smoking history. His family medical history is non-contributory. And his review of systems is also non-contributory other than what was already mentioned above. So with that information, what might his diagnosis be? At this point, we'll need to consider a concept called a key feature. This is any element of a patient's presentation which might help to distinguish one diagnostic possibility from another. Not every detail in the medical history or even the history of present illness is helpful in identifying the cause of the patient's symptoms. By identifying the key features as such, it's, it helps us to not be distracted by everything else. This is not to say that everything else is irrelevant. Some of it is very, very important in understanding the patient as a person and understanding how the disease is affecting them. But we need to separate these things out just for the purposes of determining the possible diagnoses. So let's go through the history again and highlight what are the key features. His age, history of diabetes and hypertension, since they are notable risk factors for cardiovascular disease, like heart attacks and heart failure. The duration of the dyspnea, the fact it was abrupt in onset, consistent of a discrete episode, and then recurred once. The absence of these two symptoms and sick contacts. We already flagged the past medical history. The meds are probably not directly relevant here. And the only particularly notable thing in the social history is probably the rare alcohol and lack of smoking. Now that we've identified the key features, let's rearrange them by asking, who is the patient and what is the disease? Key features that help to answer the first question include that he is a 42-year-old man with diabetes and hypertension, has rare alcohol use, and is a non-smoker. Key features that help to answer the second question are the abrupt onset of the dyspnea, 
that it has occurred in two discrete episodes, ranging from five minutes in the first to 30 minutes and counting for the second, and that there are no associated symptoms. We've used the key features concept to boil the entire history down to its most diagnostically essential elements. It's at this point that we can now provide a meaningful, partially informed answer to the question of what might his diagnosis be. And to do that, I'll introduce the concept of a differential diagnosis. A differential diagnosis, often shortened to just the differential, is a list of diagnoses which could reasonably explain a specific patient's presentation based on information available at the time. It is usually placed in order of estimated descending probability. In other words, the most likely diagnosis is listed first. Sometimes, it will also include one to two unlikely diagnoses if the consequences of missing those are particularly severe. So what is our patient's differential? Here were the key features, and here is one of the diagnostic frameworks for acute dyspnea. Remember, one of the key features was that it's episodic. This is particularly helpful because it's a relatively uncommon feature of dyspnea. So let's cross off all the diagnoses on our framework that do not usually cause episodic dyspnea, and we'll see what's left over. COPD and asthma exacerbations, mucus plugging, arrhythmias, acute coronary syndrome, and anxiety disorders. That's really it. The differential should be organized by descending probability. So based on the other key features, which of these seems most or seems least likely? Well, COPD, let's start there. In a non-smoker at the age of 42, that would be extremely uncommon and exacerbations of COPD simply don't last as short as five minutes. So I'm gonna cross that off the list altogether. Asthma is more likely than COPD to present in the 40s in a non-smoker. And while asthma exacerbations can be shorter, self-resolving after only five minutes would be really atypical. So I'll keep this on the list, but it's low probability. A mucus plug in a middle-aged person with no previous pulmonary problems that would put them at risk for that is virtually unheard of. So that's crossed off also. Arrhythmias can present at any age, though as a very general rule, pathologic bradyarrhythmias are more common in the elderly and more likely to cause lightheadedness than dyspnea as compared to tachyarrhythmias. So I'll reorder these as such. Now, what about acute coronary syndrome, which to remind you includes heart attacks, as well as something called unstable angina, which can be episodic, though it usually causes chest pain rather than dyspnea. Well, our patient is on the young side for acute coronary syndrome, but he does have two significant risk factors, the diabetes and hypertension. So it's definitely going to remain somewhere on the differential, maybe not at the top, but it's certainly more likely than asthma and more likely than bradyarrhythmias too. And last is anxiety. We haven't been given any specific psychiatric history, but if we were to assume that that's because he has none, rather than it just being a bad omission, which is a bit of an assumption, that will make something like a panic attack a bit less likely, but still certainly possible given his history. So when all is said and done, my differential might look like this. Tachyarrhythmia, ACS, panic attack, bradyarrhythmia, and asthma exacerbation. Now, other experienced clinicians who saw this case might come up with a different differential, either in what diagnoses are included or in the specific order, and that's okay. As I discussed in this course's introduction video, clinical reasoning is imprecise, but there are limits to reasonable disagreement. For example, if you thought ACS was more likely than tachyarrhythmias in this patient, I'd say that's a totally fine and defensible position. But if you said that tachyarrhythmias should not be on the list at all, or that pneumonia was the most likely diagnosis, I'd say both of those suggestions were definitely incorrect. Let's step away from the case for a second to compare diagnostic frameworks and differential diagnoses. A framework is symptom-specific, while a differential is patient-specific. 
A framework is not influenced by the details of the patient's presentation, while a differential is very dependent on those details. A framework is comprehensive, typically more than 20 diagnoses for most symptoms, signs, or lab abnormalities, whereas a differential diagnosis is focused. About four to six diagnoses is typical for most presentations after the history has been given. A framework is organized by organ system, anatomic region, or physiologic mechanism, whereas a differential is listed in descending order of probability. And last, a framework is static over time, whereas a differential is iterative, meaning that it is updated with each piece of new data. Sometimes that update means diagnoses get removed from consideration. Sometimes that update means the order of diagnoses changes. And once in a while, it means that a diagnosis you had not included originally because it was felt to be too improbable gets added. So on that note, let's return to the case to get more info and to update our differential. Here's a physical exam. He's a middle-aged man who appears his state of age and who is in moderate respiratory discomfort. Vitals are most notable for a pulse of 160, blood pressure of 96 over 70, respiratory rate of 26, and oxygen saturation of 95% on room air. He has moderate symmetric crackles at both lung bases. The tachycardia is regular with hyperdynamic S1 and S2, which is just a fancy word meaning those sounds are louder than normal. JVP is moderately elevated and pulses are weak. From this new information, how should we revise our differential diagnosis? Are there diseases that we should eliminate from consideration, in which case we can say that they've been ruled out? Well, since there was no wheezing heard, and asthma was already relatively unlikely, I'd consider that ruled out at this point. The extremely fast heart rate obviously rules out a bradyarrhythmia, and even horrific panic attacks don't trigger hemodynamic instability. So we're left with a tachyarrhythmia and ACS. I think a tachyarrhythmia has almost been ruled in as a primary etiology, but given the danger of ACS if it's missed, I would not want to completely rule that out until we had at least two more pieces of data, specifically an ECG and a troponin, both now and in a few hours. So at this point you might think, great, we're done. We have a probable diagnosis of tachyarrhythmia. But that's not the end of the story because tachyarrhythmias is just a category itself and has its own framework and its own differential diagnosis. For example, is this patient experiencing atrial flutter, atrioventricular nodal tachycardia, ventricular tachycardia, or something else totally different? This is just another way in which the differential is iterative. Sometimes the framework from which the differential is drawn is changed too. Putting that particular case behind us, there is one final point to make today about frameworks and differentials. In common usage, both diagnostic frameworks and differential diagnoses are called differential diagnoses. So for example, you might be on your medicine clerkship as a third year student and on rounds with the team, the attending could suddenly turn to you and say, so medical student, can you tell me the differential diagnosis for epigastric pain? in the absence of context, that is, in the absence of a specific clinical case that they're referring to. What that attending is asking for is your framework, not your differential, as the word is un understood in context of clinical reasoning. You will also occasionally hear clinicians use the term differential diagnosis as a synonym for the entire process of clinical reasoning. These terminology quirks are confusing for students and incredibly frustrating for me personally but medicine appears to be stuck with them for now. The key takeaway points for this video are three definitions. A key feature is an individual element of a patient's presentation, which might help to distinguish one diagnostic possibility from another. A diagnostic framework, also known as a diagnostic schema, is a comprehensive list of diagnoses that can cause a symptom, sign, or lab finding, which is typically organized by organ system anatomic region, or physiologic mechanism. And last, a differential diagnosis is a list of diagnoses which could plausibly explain a specific patient's presentation based on information available at the time, usually placed in the order of estimated descending probability.